case people need to watch it. But um, uh, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about emotional disabilities too. But when we were teaching this lesson, what was I gonna do? Just have them read. So what do we do whenever we we're reading a book as a class? Well, we there's a variety of ways that we can read a book in a, as a class. What? How did you guys read books in classes at your school growing up? What did the teacher do? Drea? Jenna? Renee? Um, I know that like, well, in high school when we read books, we would go into groups and then annotate and discuss and then um, I'm pretty sure there were like some visuals too. So you guys would read to yourselves and then talk about it, or you would read in the small groups too. Um, each other? we would we would read in small groups sometimes, like I'll, like I'll. a chunk. Yeah, like so, like a group of five students, and there would be like four groups. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So that's one way, right? You read in a really small group out loud to each other and kind of popcorn around. How else? Um, at my high school, we always were sent home with the chapters or section that we had to read and we had to annotate it and put questions in the margins. If we had any or on sticky notes, if it was a book, um, and then we'd come back to class and we'd have a discussion. But we also did um, the same as uh, what Drea said, where we popcorn read either in small groups or in large groups as like a whole class. Yep. So a lot of times you just read it on your own at home, right? You read it silently to yourself, okay? Did any of you guys have uh, your teacher listen to a CD or of reading it out loud or you, she read out loud and you followed her? That, that happens sometimes where they'll play like a reading of it and then everyone just follows along on their own. Um, sometimes it's popcorn in the whole class where you just go down the line and everybody reads a paragraph and you just keep doing that. Um, are there any other ways that your classes read? So what are we missing in that? What, what type of learning style are we missing when we have that kind of an equation? If we're just doing reading, is that what you mean? If we're just reading? Yeah, if we're just popcorning around or we're reading it, to, what are we missing? Um, you're missing a lot of them. I mean, you're missing visual and like to an ex extent, maybe like the kinesthetic. Mm -hmm. um, so what can we do to get those two pieces in, involved? So I'll tell you what I did. So in my class, we had kids read night and we did it just like that where we did popcorn or whatever but then after every single chapter i would bring in the art teacher and the art teacher would actually talk to them about the emotion of colors and then we would actually spend time painting our emotions on a canvas of what we felt after that chapter and then the next chapter we would paint on top of that emotion that we felt from last chapter and paint new emotion and then new emotion and then new emotion to where at the end of the book, they had a canvas that had painted all of their emotions from what they felt reading this really intense book. It was a way to get what's inside outside and it was a way to get them moving around, physically doing something and tying in what they felt while they, while they were painting. So we would do the popcorn reading, but then while they painted, I would actually play a video, a CD of someone reading the book again, or reading that chapter again, so that they could have that in their mind while they were painting. So that's one way to do something physical, right? To get them involved. What's something else we can do? What, what do we do with the visual? Uh, just uh, my uh, experience for the uh, reading the book for the kids uh, when they uh, just a, a small group uh, the kids sit and the teachers reading for the kids and after uh, uh, said to the kids and question to kids okay 
what what is book what the talk, talk about this book and uh, what this chapter what the uh, picture for the uh, this chapter and the kids uh, when they're listening and after talking to the uh, kids okay this uh, this pa uh, page and pictures talked about this and the uh, after the finish uh, 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 question to kids, okay, uh, uh, what uh, you have the experience talk about the cheat, uh, book, uh, or you can talk about the book, uh, talk to your parents and uh, share to your friends and your, your uh, uh, children, uh, the children in the classroom, and said yes, okay. And the talking, and the uh, I, I had the one class uh, talk about the children literature, and they talk about the books, and the uh, uh, this book, what is this, and talking, or they had the picture, and they can they had the project of talk about the um, book, and has more experience. Uh, for the reading the book and the uh, teach to the kids and the set to the kids. So you're talking about comprehension, which is great. And that's a great thing to do, to ask them questions and get them to know if, if they understood what you were talking about, to look at the pictures in the book, that kind of stuff. That's all really great, but that is still um, auditory, right? That's still auditory and that's still verbal and that's great. But what, what we want to do is want to get them active. So another way to get them active is instead of showing them pictures in the book, what if we ask them to create a comic strip of what they learn that chapter? So they end up drawing their own pictures, right? And so they're doing something physical, but it's something that they're also able to see and they're able to comprehend. So that way it's not just saying it back to me, it's actually drawing maybe like a little comic or drawing their favorite scene from the story. And that way we're actually moving it into a physical realm to gain their understanding of the text. So it's things like that, that we have to do to add in all senses if we can. Um, the visual, we don't wanna give them a picture. And the worst thing that teachers do is show kids the movie of the book. Um, the yeah. reason why that is the worst thing teachers do is because what happens is whenever you read, your mind is able to create an imagination of what you're reading. And so your brain becomes engaged in painting the picture for your mind. But whenever you actually watch it on a video, now there's no imagination. There's no creativity. They're painting the picture for you so you don't have to do any work. We want our kids to do the work. We want their brains to grow and be creative and imagine new things. And we do that with reading, but whenever we show them a video, now it takes that creativity and it actually brings it back down um, and doesn't allow them to grow that. So I will warn you about that. That is a, an issue I see a lot in schools and even I've done that myself. So I, we all, it happens. And sometimes it's okay. Sometimes there's good movies to watch, but. Sometimes if you have a 1970s version of the Iliad and the Odyssey and you want to show that to your class, that is, I don't recommend that. <laughs> what about watching the movie version after you've read the book? So it's only okay if you've already done all those visual things first, right? You've already done the active stuff. It's when you do that instead of the active stuff that would become a problem. Does that make sense? Because um, if you are like, it should be in addition for me watching a movie in class in general isn't really education isn't really learning um, and i know people are like well there's a worksheet they fill out while they watch it whatever i get it now visual learnings are important it's great but watching a two-hour video and spending three and a half class periods on it for me is not quite the same as engaging with it watching 10-minute clips and then talking about it that's way more effective than just watching all the whole hour and being like, what'd you guys think? Because now we're actually numbing the brain. We're not allowing it to be creative and imaginative. So um, that's a great way to summarize, just basically talking a little bit about multiple learning styles. Um, I will ask you for your final report, your expert report. You are gonna have to talk a little bit about the different ways to reach that disability that you choose. So keep that in mind. 
We are going to talk about tiering, which is your work for this week, how to tier assignments or tier classrooms. And then we're going to look a little bit about emotional disabilities. I want to talk uh, briefly about what that looks like and, and, and what happens because emotional disorders and emotional disabilities will actually be something that you will come across pretty often in education. Again, I'm trying to, when we meet on Mondays, hit a disability highlight so that we can talk about it so that you're, you're able to kind of look at it and go, oh, is that one I wanna do for my expert report or is there something else? So I want that to be helpful. All right, so we'll first look here, which is um, tiering. This is from your, your work, differentiating instruction and tiering. So if I asked you what you thought tiering meant, what, what do you think tiering is in education? How do we use that word tiering? Is that where you're like um, building off of uh, past like knowledge or experience? Like you can't do one type of work without having um, the knowledge of what you need to actually do that work? So that's, um, that's what we call scaffolding when you're building on top of each other, which is really great. Tiering is a little different. Tiering is, again, I hate these educational words because we only use them in education, but tiering is basically where you do one assignment for the class, but then you tier it based on student level. So maybe the assignment is, it's basically how you accommodate and modify, right? So you have an assignment, you want everyone to learn the 50 states of America, right? The goal is for them to learn all 50 states, fill out this map, color it. This is like a sixth grade uh, social studies assignment. We have to do this. So the way we tier it is for some students who are exceptional, gifted, um, they may find this assignment easy. So we would tier it by asking them to do capitals and states, right? But if you have a student who really struggles with reading, maybe you just want them to do abbreviations of states, or maybe you want them to do 40 out of 50 states, or all the states that have the same letters as their name, you know, something different, something that's still kind of fun and makes them want to do it, but also it, it tears that assignment. So it's making it easier for the ones who struggle, and it's making it more difficult for the ones who don't struggle. So it's how you tier assignments. So let's say you were going to do a um, simple math problem. Let's just do addition, right? You're teaching two double digit addition. So 22 plus 42, right? Double digit addition. What is a way that you could tier that concept, that idea for the advanced kids in your class and the kids who struggle in your class? So for easy, um, for kids that struggle, you could have it where, um, where it's static. So like the, you're, well, you're adding 11 plus 55. There's nothing that you have to like carry over. And maybe for mm -hmm. kids that um, that's easy, you create numbers that are more dynamic so that they do have to carry over. Yep. That's a great way to start, right? That is a really easy step to basically getting them used to the information. Now we definitely want those lower tiered kids to get to a point where we don't have to keep tiering it. But when we first introduce a concept, we probably are gonna have to tier it pretty heavily. And that's fine, that's normal. So you guys need to get comfortable with how you tier assignments. How do you tier uh, uh, standards? How do you tier objectives? And that's what this lesson this week is gonna be about, is about tiering those things. So it makes it, when you get a, your roster and you look at your curriculum and you see kids that are low and kids that are high, it's not like you just have to accommodate and modify and it's easy. Well, how do you do that? Well, tiering is the way you do that. And that's why tiering is really important. Now, again, you can, can, you, you can tier with grades. How would you tier with grades and not the actual assignment? Do you know how you might tier with grades?
you were going to guess, and that's okay. Uh, it's fine. So the way you tier with grades is that it would take um, maybe if this kid does this assignment um, and you have the same grading scale that you use for everybody, but for these two kids, if they get a 70% or higher, that's an A, and a 70% or lower, that's a B. You know what I mean? You tier it based on, uh, we don't want to do, it's not a curve, it's not a bell curve, because that's what you use for the whole class. This is changing the grading system for this one assignment for these two students. So you, it's, it's a way to basically say, as long as you get 75% of these right, that's an A for you. So that's a way that you can do it. And then you input it into your grade book as an A, even though on, they missed 10, right, out of the 20. So that's just a way for you to tier grades based on ability level. So could you also um, not have the same amount of like problems? Like say it was a math sheet and you had like 20 questions, 20 problems. Could you have um, just a totally different number or is that getting more into a modification? No. That's an accommodation. When I talk about changing the grade scale, that's a modification, you're modifying it. But when you're talking about just giving them less problems, that's an accommodation and you can definitely do that. Um, but what you have to be careful of is while you can modify the grades for lower kids, you can't modify the grades necessarily for the higher kids. So what I mean is you can't say, well, you have to get every single one of them right to get an A. Because now we're messing with that higher grade scale. And now we're going into this whole realm of, well, is it an honors class? If it's not an honors class, you can't do that. But there are honors classes where a 92 is still a B. And that is how it's set up. So they already have modified those, the higher end, the higher version of tiering. That's typically already modified. What I would always do is anybody who finished their work right away, who was really smart, gifted, they were fast, whatever, is I would have subsequent um, extra credit assignments in my desk that I would turn to them and say, now I want you to complete this. Now I want you to complete this. And it may be a, a, an extension of what they've already done. Um, so if they're gonna answer these questions, now I want them to go ahead and write out an explanation of how they did every question. Because that's that higher level learning, right? If you can do 22 plus 11, great. But if you can write out in a paragraph form how you did it, now I know you know right? Now that's next level learning. So then I would make that the next assignment if they were finishing too early and getting done and distracting other kids. So tiering is a really important way to access modifications and accommodations. So you're going to learn about it this week. You're going to have a um, discussion question this week. I think you're going to practice um, in an assignment trying to tier stuff for people. So that's good. So you'll be able to work on that a little bit this week. Questions about tiering. Okay, I don't wanna spend the whole time on it because that, then we don't need to do the lesson. <laughs> and who doesn't wanna do that? Come on. All right. So let's look at um, emotional disabilities. When we look at emotional disabilities, we have to start talking about this idea that, uh, uh, well, let's go with the causes. This is a hard disability to talk about because it's one of the only disabilities that you cannot be born with. So you are not born with an emotional or behavioral disorder. It is something that is developed. Now you can be, have a spectrum disorder and have emotional issues and that is not the same thing. So your spectrum disorder can display like you have an emotional disorder, but they are different things. The root cause is different. A emotional disorder kid is typically, and again, we're gonna stereotype, which I don't like to do, but in the, in the case of teaching, sometimes you have to, um, these are going to be kids who come from foster homes. 
These are going to be kids who are typically have physical, emotional, or sexual abuse in their past. Um, these are going to be kids who uh, were maybe sick for a long time. They just been long spans in the hospital when they were a kid without a lot of touch, without a lot of healthy touch, without a lot of um, care. Um, we see a lot of kids when they're a little bit older. If you're a child of war, um, like kids that when I was in high school, we had a bunch of kids come over from Bosnia and Herzegovina when there was a big war in the 90s there. And they had what we called PTSD as, as high school kids, but it manifested as an emotional or behavioral disorder. They actually would want to fight. Um, they had a fight or flight response that was really heightened. Did you have a question, Renee? <laughs> what about um, students that are, or children that are, um, whose parents have PTSD because they may have, um, were like an active military and were in Afghanistan or something? I mean, is that common? Yeah, so that can, that can. Now, what we don't want to say is because of this, it equals this. Because that's not always true, right? There's kids who have gone through a lot of trauma and have come out without an emotional disorder. So I don't want to say that just because this happens, you have it. But stereotypically, yes. If you have someone, a parent who has PTSD, um, the chances of you having uh, emotional trauma are higher, right? Because of all sorts of things, whether it's um, alcohol abuse, whether it's um, you know other types of like anger or emotional outbursts that affect you growing up. Yeah, that can totally affect your emotional and behavioral stability. So those things can play a part, but we can't use it as a recipe to say A plus B always equals C because that's not true. We don't really know until it starts to manifest. And it can manifest really young or it can manifest when they're older. I've had kids who, um, I'll tell you about Connor. So Connor was a kid who had an emotional disability um, he grew up in a single parent home. I think there was uh, physical and emotional abuse from his father who was no longer in the picture. And what had happened is he did not have a regulator on emotions. So when you and I, when we feel emotional, we have a regulator and people will say, are you okay? And we can say, uh, give me a second and we can compose ourselves. We can excuse ourselves and go to the bathroom and cry. We can actually yell into our pillows. We have coping mechanisms for our emotions. These kids do not have that. They do not have that thing in their brain that says, I am feeling this. They don't have that. They go from zero to 10 out of nowhere. They will be looking at you and then they will be screaming at you. And you're like, how did we get here? It's because they don't have those blockages that say, hey, I'm feeling this and I don't know, or you need to go for a walk, or they don't have any of that. That has not been formed in their brain. And because that was not formed, they swing between emotions very, very uh, sporadically. So you can have them crying one moment, screaming one, throwing things, angry, upset, and they just go back and forth. Now, it's not the same as bipolar. Bipolar disorder is a chemical imbalance in your brain. This is not a chemical imbalance. This is a sociological and psychological problem that has happened in the brain. When trauma happens, our brain grows around that trauma until we go back and work through it. These kids have not worked through it because they are kids. So this is a really complex disability, but what you need to know to recognize it are going to be things like I don't know if you guys have ever heard of oppositional defiance disorder, but that's where if you have kids come in your class and some kid is labeled ODD, which falls under this category, you may say, hey guys, have a seat. And he'll just stand there. And you're like, no, no, have a seat. But he, he wants to be oppositionally defiant. So he will do the opposite of what you ask. That is ODD. And that can be really difficult to teach. Now, if it's that severe, these kids won't be in your class, right? They'll be in a self-contained environment or they even have their own school. We have ED schools that exist. The ACES is one, Canyon State is another. 
So ED schools are out there. So you won't really see the really bad end of it. Um, I had, like I was starting to tell you the story of Connor. Connor, uh, his mother started dating and he got really angry and he used to scream at her and call her a whore. And he would like try to punch her as he was six foot tall, he was big but he saw his own father become abusive. So he thought it was okay to be abusive. So he would try to beat up his mom. So she would lock herself in her door at night in her own room and to keep away from her own son. Now he was in my class that we painted our emotions for the book night. But one time we were sitting in class and this kid, Josh, who was really popular, who just had an alerting disability was also in this class. He was a star athlete. And Connor looked at him one day in class and said, why don't you say hi to me in the hallway when I see you? And the kid, Josh said, what? And he said, how come when I see you outside of this class? He said, inside this class, you talk to me. Outside this class, you refuse to talk to me. I don't understand what's wrong. Now, that's a really valid question, right? And you and I, we could talk about it and we could have a discussion about it. But Connor could not. So when Josh said, oh, I see you, I say hi to you, and he just kind of blew it off, Connor started to escalate. And he said, it's kids like you that make kids like me want to shoot up this school, and I can't believe you. And, and then he just keeps going further and further, and he's like, I hate you all, and you rich kids, and, and popular kids, and you don't understand, like, I'm the kind of kid. And he just starts to escalate, and he cannot bring himself down. So I, as the teacher... I have to get everybody out of the room so that they are safe and I get to de-escalate Connor. And I do this by listening to him, by affirming him, by saying, I hear you, I hear what you're saying, tell me more, what's going on, what's underneath that? And we basically, he ended up just crying into my arms afterwards and kind of sunk down. So he ran the full gamut of emotions but it was scary at times because he threatened people, he threatened an educational institution, he threatened kids. We had to make sure that we went to his house to make sure he didn't have access to weapons. I mean, it was a whole huge process. So this is a tough group when I say that. Um, all right, let's go to the causes. Again, here's the problem with emotional disabilities is that nobody really knows the true cause. There are things that contribute. Um, sometimes people think that it's hereditary uh, and there might be a component to that, but is it hereditary if you grew up in a home and that's how everybody acted? Or did you just learn that behavior really young? I, I don't know. That's the debate, right? Um, some people think it actually is where you, you hit your head when you were a kid. Um, this could be where it has to do with maybe um, some type of diet issue, stress, um, so they're researched, but we still have not come to a common conclusion about what it means for you when you have this. So if we look at some of the category, the category is emotional disturbance is what everything falls under. But also we talk about behavior disorders. Behavior disorders are where I misbehave, but I'm not doing it because I'm doing it because of my disability not because I don't like you. So it takes a very special teacher to work with this group, this population, because we can take it personally. When you're not doing what I ask, I'll take that personally. But people who work with this population, they don't take it personally. They understand that it's not about me, it's about you, uh, your disability, and you wanting to not do anything. You wanna sit in your emotions and not show up and do classwork. That's okay but we have to figure out how to do that. Now, because these kids typically are behind socially and they are hyper emotional, what we see is we see way more boys diagnosed with this disorder than we do girls. And the reason why is because it manifests in different ways. Boys wanna make connection emotionally. And so how would you typically see boys making connection emotionally. What do you think? How does that typically look? When two guys are hanging out and bonding, what does that look like? I know none of your boys. 
So it looks like pushing, it looks like shoving, it looks like hitting, it looks like, you know what I mean? Jumping on each other's backs. It looks more aggressive. And so that's why we can find more boys who operate this way because they're trying to bridge that emotional connection by being hyper aggressive. And so we recognize that's an issue because they'll go too far with their aggression and then that's not okay. Um, girls who have this, they want a hot wire connection as well. And so the problem is, is that means that they either um, become mean girls, which we think are typical, or they actually are hypersexually. They try to make a connection sexually because they don't know how to make it emotionally because they have such a problem emotionally. So I had a girl who um, had this disability in high school and she ended up sleeping with most of the baseball team um, at the high school level. And then pictures got out, rumors got out and she was devastated, but she was trying to build connection. And the only way she knew how was through physical contact. And that is not, we had to reteach her how to make those connections healthy emotionally. Again, this isn't how they always play out. This is my experience on how they've played out. So it definitely depends. All right, so uh, there is a lot of research about how do we basically steer kids behaviorally. And one of the ways we steer kids behaviorally is through what's called positive behavior support. Um, there's a program called PBIS, Positive Behavior Intervention Strategies. And PBIS is not the same as PBS. PBIS is a company and they get paid to do that. PBS is the idea of the strategy and anybody can use it. So basically you focus on the positive. So instead of saying, stop throwing that, sit down, don't do that. Don't you say, Hey, John, thank you so much for paying attention. Hey, John. And you actually are praising them when they do well so that that's when they get noticed. If you only notice them when they do negative, they will continue to do negative. But when you notice them, when they do positive, they will start doing positive. So we have to make sure that this is an important element when we work with this population. Part of the issue is that they already struggle emotionally. And now when you harp on them emotionally, they're simply going to get more and more defeated. And then they're going to act out in crazy ways. Um, that's why behavior support PBS is really important. This might be something where if they do escalate, they're go to a separate room with nothing on the wall, nothing they can break. And you actually have them work out a worksheet. And the worksheet is, what happened? How did it make you feel? Why did you feel that? And it slowly walks them through what happened internally so that they can make changes for next time. Now PBIS, anybody have PBIS at the schools they worked at? Ever heard of PBIS before? PBIS is basically where like, if you do something good around school, they give you like a buck, like a fake buck. And then you can go shop at the school store and get erasers and candy and that. So it's like focusing on positive behaviors. But listen, if I'm a 16 year old kid and you wanna hand me a, a central high school dollar, I'm gonna tell you to go jump off a cliff, right? Like there's an element where shopping at the school store for an eraser no longer becomes cool, no longer becomes something people want. So we have to kind of walk that line of how do we add positive behavior support at the high school or older level because that can be trickier. Now again, just because you have a diagnosis of emotional disability or emotional disturbance doesn't mean you need an IEP. You only need it if those behaviors impede with your learning. Now the chances of them impeding with the learning are pretty high, to be honest. But there are kids who have behavior issues, who have them at home or have them in other places, and they don't really manifest at school, so they don't need an IEP. So it definitely depends. Now if you do have, yeah, go ahead. 
if you do have, this is going to be probably the most interesting disability we talk about. So it's okay if you guys have a ton of questions, that kind of stuff. Because we don't know a ton about it, um, where it comes from and how it's created, it, there's a lot of mystery around here about this disability. So um, if I'm not answering your questions, that please ask any questions you've got. Because this is, um, this is a trickier one than, than most people have. So if you do, if you are labeled ED, is what the acronym is, um, here it stands for emotional disturbance. Um, it stands for other things in other places. But when we talk about ED, you always will have to have psychological or counseling services in your IEP. You cannot have an emotional disturbance and then not get counseling services. You have to have those, those go hand in hand. That's how we work through your tools emotionally is by seeing a social worker or seeing a counselor or seeing a psychologist every week or every other week or once a month, whatever it is to get those tools bolstered. Are those um, always provided by the school? Yep, in fact, even if you're homebound, the school district you live in still has to provide those services. So if you homeschool your kid and they're labeled ED, that school district you live in the boundaries of should still be sending somebody to your house once a month to give that kid those services because that is a federal mandate. That is important. So yes, the school will provide that. Now, some schools do, especially right now, how do you provide that when not every kid is there or what's going on? So sometimes you have to provide that through what we call telehealth. And telehealth is simply like a, a, a bolstered up Zoom where you can meet with people over that. So it's just a platform on the computer, but it doesn't matter. Now, if you have a kid who is acting out and you don't know how to de-escalate them, what are, you, what, are your, what are your options as a teacher? Let's talk about your options and what, what do you do? You have a kid, you ask them to do something and they say no. Now what? Now what? You don't have a paddle. This is where the rubber meets the road. I mean, this is the tough stuff because there's going to be a kid you're going to have is going to look at you and go, no. <laughs> so I work in a Montessori school and we, um, we push a lot of independence and being responsible for your own choices. So when we ask like certain questions that have um, like a, a closed response, a yes or no, I mean, we try and steer away from that, but we don't force kids to do things. I mean, unless it's something that is gonna like harm them. Um, so in our environment, if they're saying no to it, then there's typically a, a, a consequence that, um, you know, falls in line with whatever they're saying no to. Like if they're not gonna clean up um, where they were sitting at lunch, then they're not gonna go to recess until it's done. Um, but in some cases they get sent to the office, which is really just our secretary and they just kind of sit there until they cool off and are ready to come back and cooperate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's this element of, um, negotiating, right. With the kid. And that, that's something that I want to take away from, because I will say that when we start arguing or negotiating with the kid, we have now lost that battle, right? So some of the ways that we can do this, and there's a couple different ones, and you have to find your own. For me, it was to sit down next to the kid or to say, hey, come, come over here. And I would take them, whatever they were, if they were sitting at the lunch table and they weren't doing it there, then I would remove them from the lunch table and take them on a walk. And I would say, what's going on? Why do you not feel like doing it? Like, what, tell me what's happening. Because for me, that was a sign that there was something else going on. It didn't actually have to do with the lunch, right? It had to do with something else. Now, if it was just the lunch, they could be like, I just didn't want to do it today. 
And I'll be like, all right, so here's the deal I'm going to make you. I'm going to do it for you today, but now I need you to do it for someone else and yourself tomorrow, right? And I would, I would kind of just talk to them about that. But if it's a situation where they're like, no, uh, so-and-so, have, something happened at home or this is going on, then I know there's something deeper going on. And that takes a relationship with the student. So the only way that PBS works, the only way that discipline works is if you have a relationship. Because if you don't have a relationship with the kid or you don't have a good relationship with the student, then it becomes a power struggle. And power struggles rarely turn out well for teachers. You are actually going to start seeing the Montessori model go into more typical public education because they do have this idea of children's choice and independence. And we are seeing that crop up in more public schools. It used to be where it was my way or the highway. I would write you a detention and then I would hold you after class. You waste my time, I waste your time. And we started doing all of this stuff. The problem is, is that we found out that um, it was actually doing more harm than good for those kids. So we were actually harming their psyche, we were harming their emotions, we were harming their mental state, and we didn't want to do that. So we had to change up how we were doing business. And the way we change it up is by taking the holistic child approach. And that means that if you, have, if you don't have a good relationship, but the teacher next door has a better relationship with that kid, then working with that teacher to talk to that student, figuring out what's going on behind the behaviors. Sometimes the behavior is happening because they want an audience. They want to do it in front of the class. They want to be funny. They want to whatever. So that's when you don't fight it. You take away the audience. That's why I would have them come, hey, meet me outside. Let's talk for a second. And then we take them out of the audience and find out what's actually happening. And sometimes there's a lot of other things going on and they just don't know how to respond. So their brain says, shut everything down. Shut it all down. And so they just stop doing the work. They don't want to do anything that day. And that's because their brain is overloaded. We have in the trauma world, something called an ACE score, A-C-E. And what A-C-E means is it's basically taking all of your issues, whether you were raised in a lot of poverty or you were raised in uh, around a lot of abuse or you were raised without a lot of food or you were raised with, um, sexual violence or emotional violence or physical violence, that's actually going to raise your ACE score. And the higher your score is, the more supports you need to access the curriculum. Because think about it, if there's a lot of stress going on around you, how are you able to concentrate on 22 plus 11? Who gives a crap what 22 plus 11 is when I have to go back home and I'm worried I'm going to fear for my life? So the A score is something, it's a predictor to look at the trauma that our kids in our class have to deal with. So you'll learn a lot more about this whenever you start learning about social emotional learning, whenever you get to your schools and they talk a little bit about this. Now to be fair, some of our teachers and some of you students, you also have an A score. The teachers also have an A score. So sometimes uh, we react out of our triggering, right? Uh, I had a kid, his name was Rory. He was a senior in high school. And I told him to pick his head up. He was putting his head down while we were taking a test. And I said, Rory, put your head up. Rory, put your head up. Rory, put your head up. And he looked at me and he said, F you, F this school, F this class. He flipped over his desk, kicked open the door and walked out. Now, if I was going to respond out of my own childhood, my own A score, then I would have taken out my earrings, handed them to somebody else, kicked open the door, and I would have handled it like I did back when I grew up on the West Side. But obviously that is not what you wanna do. These are kids, he's 18, but he still has a brain of a 12, 13 year old. So I let him go. He came back in 20 minutes with a monster energy drink and said, all right, I'm ready to work now. And he sat down and went back to work. And we talked about it afterwards and we came up with a plan of when he feels overwhelmed, that he will not do that and what, what's our plan for him to do. So we have to have, again, that relationship. To this day, Rory is one of my Facebook friends. He sends me a thank you card every Christmas for responding to him and letting him grow as a student. 
Um, he was the biggest pain in the world, but, but that's part of the, part of the job when you're talking about students with special needs. Um, your site, your school will also have a plan of what they want you to do and how they want you to react to these students um, and what to do. But let me share one more thing with you while we're on it. So these are great because I really like these alternatives to saying calm down. Um, when students are upset, obviously just like what I've learned um, uh, from my mom, my sister in the dating world is to not say calm down. That's not, doesn't work apparently. So instead talking to our students like, hey, I see you're having a difficult time. Can I help you? Um, you take a deep breath. If you need to hit something, here's a pillow. Um, I know this can be frustrating, so let's figure this out together. I see that you're mad. How does that feel inside of your body? If our students are shaking, letting them know, like, when I shake, I'm mad. Okay, now I can look for when I shake and come up with other ways to do that. Let's go for a walk instead. Um, can we count to 10? Do you want to squeeze my hand? Don't do that with high school kids, but little kids, that works well. Um, how about a big hug? Again, not right now during COVID. Uh, let's focus on fixing the problem together. And if you're feeling sad, you can tell me about it. So being available is a much better way and letting kids process through their emotions is a much better way than simply telling them to calm down or stop or go sit down. Um, those things are not going to work, especially with our kids today. Go ahead, Renee. Um, with these types of um, like emotional and behavior disorders, how easy, difficult is it generally to meet, um, to be like on the same page with parents? Because I mean, I've only had, you know, very limited experience, but for one child that I'm thinking of, um, it's like the parents are aware of their emotional issues, but they don't really seem to do anything at home to, to help with the situations. Like we've, I've asked like, what works at home that we can try at school because we're not having luck when these, you know, these outbursts happen and um, <clears throat> don't always seem to get like responses. So like, even right. though there might be an acknowledgement, like, yes, this, this child does have these certain issues, um, but if they're not getting the same type of support at home that we're not, that we're trying to apply at school, then, then what? Yeah. So that, uh, thank you. That's a, a great question. And the reality is, is yeah, yeah, that's going to happen where there, you ask parents to consistently do behavior, consistently do work, consistently do something at home so that it actually helps the kid grow all the time but they may not do that. And that's not good. One of the things I would fix is instead of saying what works at home, I would actually be really specific because parents don't know what works, what doesn't work. That doesn't really play out in their mind. So if you say something like, we're going to start trying uh, this and you give them a specific example, do you think that would work? Then I think they don't have to focus on everything, what works, what doesn't work. They focus on will that one thing work and their mind can think of the answers. So I would, I would give them specifics about what you wanna try with their kid and uh, let them know. Say, hey, your kid seems to want an audience. So I'm going to put them in a timeout room when they act out and they may say, listen, so we actually tried to use timeout at home and this is what happened for us. And then you're like, okay, good information. So that's what you want to do is be really, really specific about what you want to try. Now, the more creative, the better. But I will also tell you, one of the things is this might be hereditary. So this adult may think there is nothing wrong with this kid's behavior, even though there is something very wrong with this kid's behavior. So we have to take into account that that may be an issue. I, a lot of special ed kids have special ed parents 
And so we have to be careful whenever I'm doing meetings because the parent may be just as needy as the kid and the kid had, may have not gotten, or the adult maybe didn't get the services when they were a kid. So now I've got to like spell everything out and make sure they understand it and do all that. So sometimes that happens too. And what there's nothing you can really do about it other than try as best you can to get them on your side. So that's really difficult, that's tough, but I would be more specific and creative and say, hey, we're gonna try this. Um, have you seen anything like this at home? Well, we tried, what have you tried at home? Instead of just what works, what doesn't work. That's so vague, they're like, that it's hard for them to think down about what worked because they're thinking that day what worked, but you're talking about what has in the past. So as long as you're more specific, it limits their thinking down to, to what you need to do or what, what actually happened and what didn't happen. Um, I don't know how to phrase this question, but like statistically, certain things like to help kids, they overwhelmingly have to have support at home in order to be successful versus just getting that support at school, right? I mean, oh, yeah. yes. then it's two different worlds. Like, if, yes. and you're, you're doing all this work, but it, in the end doesn't always help them like isn't am i understanding that right yes <laughs> so all i can do is be in charge at school right that's all i can do and i can do the best i can and they could go home and everything i worked for that day at school could be completely erased by what happens at home and that sucks that's not fun it doesn't feel good but that doesn't mean that the structures i put in place in school are any less important because if that kid looks back 10 years from now, they'll say, you know what? I didn't feel safe at home, but I felt safe at school. I didn't have structure at home, but I had structure at school. And that's what I'm hoping they get 10 years from now. But in that moment, it is very frustrating. So yes, I get it, but we still have to continue to do it. Um, and that's why I think a relationship with the kid is the number one priority when we talk about behavior or emotional disabilities. Because when you have that relationship, now that's actually a bond where people are able to ask you later on how you worked it, did it, how did you figure that out? And that takes with just asking how things are, being interested, sometimes being a little vulnerable with them, but actually building that rapport with that student. Um, I don't know this. So when parents sign up their kids for school and they're on medication for anything, and maybe it's, it's something that helps with like maybe ADHD or emotional disturbances, do they have to be forthcoming? Like, do they have to put that in their, their child's like file or is that just totally voluntary? So if the kid has to take pills at school, then it has to be undocumented. But if the kid's taking them before and after, then they don't have to tell anybody. It's voluntary. Now, if the kid's on an IEP, that becomes more important to know that information. And so you could force their hand to tell you, but if they're not on an IEP and they're just a typical student, you have no recourse to force them to tell you anything. And this is why education is fun, guys. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like playing Sherlock Holmes with every single child. <laughs> Finding motivation. I know what you're all thinking now, and that's, is it too late to switch to a different major? And I get it. <laughs> but again, I, I worked as a special ed teacher, so I've seen 20, 20 kids with emotional disturbance. But the typical teacher has seen maybe five in their whole career. So don't think this is going to be every one of their students. This is typically a little rarer than you would normally see. But it is out there and they are in school. So we do have to be careful. You'll see them more often than you'll see a, a deaf student or a visually impaired student. I'll tell you that. They're more prevalent than that. I'm kind of working up towards the most that you'll see. All right, so that include, concludes everything I've got today. So I'll let you get started on your work this week for tiering and then we will um, yeah, and those of you that haven't finished your interviews, hopefully you'll finish them by next week. Again, I'm not in any rush. 
I know you are probably to move on, but that's okay. We'll work on it when we can. And uh, we should be good. So I'll, see, I'll be on here on Wednesday. Um, if you have any questions, pop in. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Have a great day. You too, Ale. Take care.